The system of publicly funded health care in this country is so important to Canadians, it's frequently mentioned as core to Canadian identity. For a journalist, that makes it a beat at the very heart of what people care about most. Andre Picard has covered it for more than 30 years as a health reporter and columnist at the Global Mail, and his new book collects some of the best of that reporting over the years. It's called Matters of Life and Death, Public Health Issues in Canada, and it brings Andre back to our studio tonight. Such a pleasure to meet you. Hi. Um, so how did you come to cover health care in the first place? Well, I really stumbled into it. I, I was a journalist. I started in the early 80s at the time that AIDS was coming along. So I started covering that at a student newspaper. And when I came to the Globe, it was just kind of entering the mainstream. Mm -hmm. So I, I started covering AIDS. Our health reporter, our medical reporter at the time, wasn't interested in the issue. Uh, you know, the reporting back then was much more formal. It was written in a journal. You wrote up the articles with experts, and that was that. Uh, <laughs> Why did, it, why did it interest you, though? Uh, I'm interested in the, you know, politics, to, to be honest, uh, mm -hmm. at the time. And that was, uh, nothing was more political than AIDS. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was a good mixture of politics and social. And, uh, you know, I remember our medical reporter saying at the time, you know, why, why would you talk to patients? What do they know? And that was really the, the, the view at the time. That's how we covered things. And it was uh, interesting to sort of ride, the, ride that wave of, of things changing in journalism and in healthcare and, and socially and in society more broadly. And over the years, you've met so many people. You've uh, written thousands of stories. Uh, but in the book, you say, in the introduction, you say that there was one particular person um, that stands out to you, and it was a patient at St. Michael's Hospital. Can you tell us that story? Yeah, so that was really the early AIDS coverage, and it was a, a classic. Somebody called into the newsroom to complain about something, and I was assigned to go over there. And this was a, a, a young man who was in hospital for uh, something that was unrelated to AIDS, uh, but he happened to be a gay man, an openly gay man, which was fairly unusual at the time. And uh, so they treated him as if he was infectious. You have to remember that at the time AIDS was people were terrified by AIDS. Everybody thought they were going to get it. Uh, you know, it was a real sort of social panic. And they put this big pink poster over his bed, you know, warning dangerous bodily fluids and nobody would come into his room to, to talk to him or to treat him or to change his bed or to feed him. And I, I went in to, to meet this guy to, to write about this outrageous situation and I remembered I shook his hand and introduced mm. myself and he burst into tears and he said you know nobody has touched me in three days and I was like oh that's so outrageous you know why, why would you treat someone like that in a health system? What lessons did you learn from that encounter? Well I learned a lot I learned that uh, you know it was a really good reminder that what matters ultimately in policy is people how policies really impact people mm -hmm. and I also learned sort of the power of the media uh, as soon as that story was published we didn't have the internet back then so it was published the next day on, in the newspaper on the front page mm -hmm. uh, St. Mike's changed their policy immediately. That guy got cleaned up. Uh, they had a committee formed that how to treat people you know, more decently. And they ultimately are one of the leading facilities for AIDS in the world. Not because of that story exclusively, of course, but mm -hmm. that was sort of a, a wake up, I think. And it's sort of, it's a reminder of we can do good with our, our work, not just inform and educate people, but actually do some good. How do you grade um, how journalism covers healthcare in Canada? Well, I think, you know, uh, we do some stuff really well, mm -hmm. uh, but I think we're still too medically focused, so we cover too many, you know, miracles that come. Uh, the, the blueberry story of the day, I often call <laughs> it, you know, the blueberry is going to prevent whatever, cancer, heart disease, etc. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of that trivial stuff. Uh, I think we don't cover enough policy. Uh, that's, that's what I tend to specialize in. I write about policy and it's complicated and it's boring and it takes more time. So we don't do that. We do a lot of clickbaity stuff. Yeah. Uh, I think the biggest failing of health journalism is we don't contextualize stuff enough because a lot of things happen. You know, there's a new study every day and the public gets frustrated because they seem to contradict each other from one day to the next. But if you put it into some context, people have to understand that's how science is. It's kind of self-correcting. If you don't look at one study in isolation, you say, listen, this is one of 20. And they all sort of have a trend telling us this. And if this one's an outlier, we should just not pay attention to it. So little things like that make for better coverage. I remember um, a couple of years ago, I guess not a couple, I guess I would say maybe 10 years ago, when uh, SARS was happening in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And it was news coverage everywhere, even going um, leaving Canada was a big deal. And it got, you write that SARS got more attention than the annual flu. 
How deadly is one compared to the other? Well, SARS was essentially a hospital-based infection that killed 44 people. It didn't kill anyone in the community, didn't really spread in the community to any noticeable amount. Mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of hospital-acquired infections that are dangerous because they're people who are susceptible, and that's what SARS ended up ultimately. Uh, the flu, on the other hand, kills three, four, five thousand people a year routinely. Uh, it's killed up to, you know, the flu in 1918 killed a hundred million people. Uh, so th just a proportion so much more dangerous and so much more important, but because something was new, because it had a, these political twists, uh, it had a humongous uh, economic impact, that story, and it had virtually no health impact in the end. So I, I think that's an example of we lost the context mm -hmm. of how important something was and how dangerous it was, and I, but probably we didn't serve the public too, too well in that case. So you write, when it comes to health care, only the United States is morally bankrupt and economically inept. Canadians take pride in besting the United States on the health front, but it is a hollow victory. In reality, every other developed country has universal health care that is better, fairer, and cheaper than ours. Why is that? Well, I think we take the easy way out. We compare ourselves to the U.S. system, which actually isn't a system. So I always say, let's ignore it. It's an outlier. We shouldn't compare ourselves to it. We should look at European countries. And I think what they've done is they've modernized and they've changed with the times. Uh, the problem with Canada's health system fundamentally is it's frozen in time. We had an excellent uh, system that was created in the 50, late 50s, early 60s for the demographics of the time, a very young uh, population having babies and with acute illnesses. The idea of chronic illness didn't really exist back then. Uh, we've gotten much better at keeping people alive who are sick, mm -hmm. so we have a lot of chronic illness today. Uh, so our system hasn't adapted to that, whereas the European countries very much have. Uh, the other part is the, the insurance aspect of it, is we cover what we covered in the 1950s. Physicians and hospitals are covered by Medicare. Mm -hmm. Everything else is covered hit and miss. Uh, European countries, it's much more, they cover about 80% of everything, dental care, home care, long-term care, doctors, hospitals, all covered publicly, but it has to be supplemented with private insurance. So they have a different philosophy there that I think serves them well. It gives more efficiency. And you actually say that um, the fact that we can't access dental care, where uh, if you have private care, you can, um, but dental care actually creates a lot of other chronic issues long term. Yeah, it's a really good example of, you know, the absurdity of what uh, the choices we make. Why do we not, why is the mouth not part of the body? That's what our insurance system tells us and it makes no sense. Uh, if you neglect the mouth, uh, all kinds of other bad things happen. It's a, a cause of inflammation. Inflammation is bad for heart, your heart, for all your organs. There's all kinds of consequences of, of neglecting something seemingly simple. You know, it's not just cosmetic. We do cosmetic things to our teeth, but just being healthy in the mouth really is often a, a barometer of the rest of the body. Why was Medicare um, created in the first place? Well, it was created to ensure that people weren't bankrupted by getting essential care. Mm -hmm. So what happened in my grandparents, uh, my parents' generation even, is that people, uh, you had an illness or you had a pregnancy and you didn't have enough money to pay for it. You lost your house, you lost your farm, etc. So there were a lot of tragic stories, they got media coverage, and it kind of forced governments to, to act. Uh, the other part of it is, uh, comes out of the war years, so uh, there were a lot of sacrifices made during the war, Second World War, and the government at the time said, you know, we have to reward the public for the sacrifices they made, and what's the best thing we can do for them? The best thing we can do for them is provide them with health care, basic health care. Mm -hmm. So there's some uh, complex history in there, and then there is just a, a specific need uh, that you know, there was more medical care, it was getting more costly, and, and people were being harmed by an inability to pay for it or to afford it. What do you think needs to be uh, changed, I guess, to come to the time? Well, I think the, the simple answer is modernizing it. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, making an insurance program that reflects the needs of people, so covering more broadly. But I think we have to, I think one of the fundamental policy questions for me is we have to decide what's covered publicly mm -hmm. and what's not because we can't cover all things for all people at all times. That's an open-ended insurance plan doesn't work. 
So we have to put limits on it. But I, I think what happens is we set the limits now very haphazardly with no rationale, uh, no thinking it through. We just do it because it's politically expedient. So I think we have to do it in a more sensible, thoughtful way, deciding how, what we... What ways would you... How would we decide what gets covered and what doesn't? Well, I think any we can look to any number of European countries on how they do that. One, mm -hmm. one is to uh, expect people to make some contributions. So if you're paying part of that bill, you're going to be more careful. Uh, another one is having boards that set formularies. Mm -hmm. So formulary is a list of things that are paid for. We do that with with drugs in Canada to a certain extent. You can do that with other medical procedures as well. So there's a num number of established ways of, of doing that. And you say that one of the most powerful drugs we have is money. Um, is how, Throwing money at problems is not the answer, you say. Why is that? Well, you know, money is the single most powerful drug we have, without mm -hmm. question. So medical care is important, but medical care is about fixing you after things have gone wrong. So how do you keep health people healthy in the first place? Uh, we know clearly, we've known for hundreds of years, what keeps us healthy is having a decent income, having a roof over our head, having decent food, uh, having a sense of belonging in the community, having an education. Those are all things that impact your health dramatically. Uh, and the medicine is actually a much smaller contribution later down the road if you're not healthy. So we, you know, this, the academics call it the social determinants of health are starting to get a lot more attention. But that's something I've written about for a long time that I've always been fascinated by it, the power of uh, what we can do societally rather than medically for people's health. Um, Two-tier healthcare is somewhat a dirty word in uh, Canada, but you argue that there is a place for the system uh, to exist. How would that work? Yeah, so I, I don't like this term two-tier because I think it's a we have a multi-tiered system in Canada, as mm -hmm. I explained. Uh, about 50% of our drugs are paid publicly, about 6%, 5% of our dental care. So it's all over the place. It's not mm -hmm. two-tiered. Uh, but the wealthy do better, without question. So uh, to me, the... The idea is to give people uh, the sense that they have to make a contribution, a personal sacrifice. And this is a view that was actually held by Tommy Douglas back at our mm -hmm. famous founder of Medicare. He didn't think everything should be covered publicly. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think we have to be careful. Let's not punish people who are poor, but let's allow uh, some contribution in there. And I think the other part of it is allow some of the uh, ability of the market to, to have some force to improve things and to... To, to influence what we do and don't do. So it's not a magical solution to privatize, but mm -hmm. I think to me the key part of the, the private element is determining what's covered publicly and then regulating well what we expect to, to pay for privately. And speaking of poverty, um, you write that homelessness is a big component of people having bad health. How is that? Well, you know, can you be healthy without a roof over your head? Mm -hmm. I think that question answers itself. And it's a, just an example of one of the determinants of health. Uh, the most unhealthy people in our society are who? We see them every day going to work on our streets. Uh, Canada has a shameless number of homeless people, 20, 25,000 on any given night. Uh, people are sleeping in our streets summer and winter. And for a, a developed, wealthy country like ours, that to me is is unconscionable. Uh, if I go to a place like Sweden or Norway, I, I'm not going to see people on the streets. It's unheard of. It's just not accepted. Uh, it's not tolerated. And policies are, are put into place so it doesn't happen. And you say that we tiptoe around this issue. Why? Does it make us uncomfortable? Well, we tiptoe around a lot of issues. Mm -hmm. We like to blame people for being poor. We like to blame them for being unhealthy. Mm -hmm. And we forget about the social construct that the society allows them to, to fall into that dark hole. Uh, uh, we forget that our social safety net used to be much better it's been quite frayed it's been eaten away at in this you know in this modern time where we think the the rich should get richer and the poor should fend for themselves it's kind of a, a mean nasty time uh, epitomized by by the Donald Trumps of the world and it's reflected in social policies and in our attitudes unfortunately I'd like to read something else from your book um, you write in reality we have a two-tiered health system but it's not a private public split it's an urban rural split the health outcomes of those who live in remote settings are poor compared with urban and suburban dwellers. Life expectancy is lower, child mortality is higher, injury rates are astronomical, and there is far more obesity and chronic illness such as heart disease. Why are rural health outcomes worse? Well, you know, Canada, we have a huge sprawling country. Most of our people live in urban settings, so they get good care, but it's hard to deliver 
good care uh, in remote areas. Uh, people who are in remote areas are often much poorer to start off with, so it's a mixture of lack of access to health care, uh, the social determinants of health, and you know, the, the other part of that story is who lives in remote areas in Canada. It's Indigenous people for the large part. When we talk about the most remote, uh, worst parts of the uh, land in the that we've isolated people on, it's Indigenous people. So when, again, I write a lot in the book about indig Indigenous peoples and how they're so, so unhealthy, 10 to 15 years less life expectancy. And it's all about their social setting. It's not about their biology. Well, I want to go into some of those numbers that you do mention. Um, life expectancy is 15 years less for Indigenous men and 10 years less for Indigenous women than the average Canadian. Infant mortality, uh, First, Nations, First Nations children die at three times the rate of other Canadian kids. It's five times higher for Inuit children. First Nations people suffer traumatic injuries at four times the rate of the general population. The suicide rate is six times higher Chronic disease, First Nations have three times the rate of diabetes. Infectious disease, tuberculosis rates are 16 times higher. What accounts for, this, for these grim inequities? Well, you know, the numbers are really depressing, especially when you catalog them like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we know what accounts for them. We created uh, a structure in society where we marginalize people. Uh, you know, I have a chapter in the book where I say, if you had this evil scientist trying to create the most unhealthy uh, situation on earth, uh, you could describe our native reserves. We brought in these laws a uh, hundred years ago or so, apartheid laws to mm -hmm. marginalize people, take away their language, take away their culture, take away their land, take away everything that makes them, allows them to be healthy. And surprise, surprise, we have the most unhealthy people in the country by a long shot. So this, there's no, nothing surprising in those statistics. There's a lot that's shameful, but there's nothing surprising because we created a situation that created poverty and, in, you know, and destroyed families and created trauma and so on and so forth. And when it comes to health care, um, how, how easy is it to access health care if you live in, in a First Nations community? Well, it's not, it's not easy at all, but, uh, you know, again, I stress that's the least of their problems, mm -hmm. to be honest. They need more health care because of the other social issues. So you have to start with the ensuring people have a house and a, a job and a sense of belonging and a, a, a language and a culture that all these things that we've taken away from them, you have to rebuild those. And the other thing I have to say, though, about in, in writing about Indigenous peoples is I hesitate now to talk about those statistics too much because mm -hmm. I think they, they tend to become overwhelming and depressing and we just throw up our hands and say there's nothing we can do. And I, and I don't think that's true because I think we forget that, uh, as in society more broadly, there's wealth and there's poverty within the Indigenous communities. So there's mm -hmm. a whole number of Indigenous communities that are very healthy and thriving and we know why, because they've retained their culture, because they've retained their language, uh, because their families weren't ripped apart by residential schools. So to me, the solution is uh, not to give up, but it's to, to take these healthy communities and help them connect with the less healthy ones and, and solve the problems beneath, between them. So I think we've made the mistake in Canada we bring in these outside experts and we're going to solve Attawapiskat or whatever. Mm -hmm. Every couple of years something dramatic happens there, we send in a bunch of money, people from the outside, nothing ever changes, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, I think if uh, communities could learn nation to nation, uh, help each other out and we could provide funding, I think to me that's ultimately where the, the solutions are going to lie. And something else that you write about is um, mental health. Mm -hmm. um, how do we treat people with mental health? Well, we treat them much better now than we did, you know, 20, 30 years ago when I started writing about this. So there's been a, quite a, sh a sea change in society, less stigma, et cetera. But uh, the problem with uh, we've beaten down stigma to a large degree. But to me, when you do that, there's this implied promise that there's going to be help. And I think we fail to, to follow through on that promise. We've spent a lot of time and energy saying, hey, it's OK to come forward and talk about your story. And that's great, but there's no point talking about it if, you, if we're not going to help you out. So again, I think we've, we've been laggards in, in Canada in helping people. Uh, the mental health system still remains the, the orphan of Medicare. Uh, again, there's historical explanations for this. When we created Medicare, 
Medicare, uh, psychiatric institutions were not included as hospitals. They were considered part of the, the penal system, mm -hmm. uh, the jail system. And that's very much still how we, we treat people with mental Which illness. Which is kind of shocking with all the information we now have. Yeah, but uh, it's shocking, but now we do it unofficially. So mm -hmm. our jails are full of who? Our jails are full of people who have mental illness. Mm -hmm. uh, you know the people you see on the streets every day, 90% severe mental illness. They, we've closed our institutions and we sent people into the streets. I, I don't see that as progress. It's, you know, it's the opposite of progress. It's quite uh, backwards. I, I don't understand why we haven't taken this more seriously. And something else that we kind of are reluctant to talk about is suicides. Mm -hmm. And I was surprised to read in your book that um, there are actually more people, more Canadians taking their own lives a year than people who were killed by, uh, who were murdered. Why are we so reluctant to talk about suicide? Well, there's many more times that the number heard. About 600 murders a year in Canada, about 3,500 suicides. So it's many times more. Uh, why are we reluctant to talk about it? Because it makes us uncomfortable. There's some uh, social mores, religious mores. Mm -hmm. uh, until the 1970s, uh, in my <laughs> lifetime, uh, it was illegal. Suicide was illegal, which is kind of an absurdity. What are you going to do, jail someone? Uh, you know, who's tried to kill themselves. But that mm -hmm. aside, there's a lot of, that created a lot of stigma. You're, you're going to go to hell. You couldn't be buried in the Catholic cemetery if there was a suicide. So there are all these things that made it a taboo to talk about. And it's, it's only now that we're starting to address that. But again, I say that the talking is a start, but the treatment and the care and the uh, inclusion of people with mental illness is, is the big challenge. And how about for uh, journalists, how we cover suicide? What do we need to do better? Well, again, I think we've we've changed a lot with with society. You know, uh, in journalism, we kind of follow, but we also have to lead. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, I, I was involved in a project called Mindset, where we created this guide uh, for journalists by journalists on how to to cover suicide and and mental health issues better. And I think things like that have have really helped uh, us be more thoughtful. Uh, to contextualize things, to, mm -hmm. to be careful. About, I think you have to be really careful about our language. We don't want to, you know, you don't want to glorify suicide and make people who are already depressed and thinking about it saying, oh, this is a good way to, to go out in a blaze of glory. So we have to be careful when we write about these issues. Recently, you wrote a column about the Netflix show, 13 Reasons Why. Why is there a controversy around that show? Well, there's this feeling that uh, contagion theory. So they think that kids are going to watch this and they're going to take their own lives. So they're going to be inspired by this. Mm -hmm. And my view on that was that, listen, they've already watched it. So we have to talk to them about how to deal with what they see in there. And there's some shocking images in there about uh, sexual violence, about a very graphic suicide. Mm -hmm. And I think we can't, uh, we can't put our kids in a bubble wrap. We have to realize that this stuff's out there in the, in the virtual world and we have to get them to talk about it and how does that make you feel and how do you respond to that. To me, that's uh, openness and transparency is, is really key to dealing with mental health issues, especially with young people. Mm -hmm. And this notion that we can hide them away and protect them and keep them innocent is just, you know, not realistic. Marijuana is going to be legalized in less than a year. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any concerns about the coming legalization? Well, I think we really have to get our act together. There's a lot of unfinished business. Uh, we don't know what the legal amount uh, you have for possession. We don't know where it'll be sold. We don't know how it'll be labeled. So all these technical things matter. So to me, the, the legalization, I, I've been a longtime proponent of legalization of all drugs, which is maybe a little controversial for people, but I think with marijuana, it's sort of a no-brainer. It should have been done a long time ago. But the question is, how do you balance this uh, realization that people are going to be smoking or taking this drug in whatever form they have for a long time and then balance it with uh, public health minimizing the harm so to me that's the challenge uh, uh, you know cigarettes are legal but we try to get people not to smoke marijuana is going to be legal i think we have to try and minimize its harm uh, you know make sure young kids don't smoke it uh, make sure it's not mixed with other things like fentanyl that can kill people there's all kinds of real public health uh, issues and consequences that come along with legalization. And then a lot of practical economic stuff. Well, speaking of fentanyl, um, is the current opioid crisis particularly different from other addiction crises that the healthcare has had to deal with? 
Well, you know, for someone like me, I've sort of seen them come and go over the years. You know, we used to have crack babies, and then there was a heroin, and, and then there was cocaine, and now it's fentanyl. Uh, I think what's different is it's more deadly, so the drugs get more powerful. Uh, they're much easier to access with the internet and stuff. You can smuggle fentanyl in micrograms and, and make a lot of money and mm -hmm. do a lot of damage. So that's, it's the technical stuff that's made it more deadly. But it's, to me, the same underlying issue is we try to uh, criminalize our way, or, you know, jail our way out of these problems, and that's not the way to do it. I, again, I, I come back to, I think we should legalize drugs and, and try and give people help who need help, and, and kind of take the, the organized crime bit out of the, the equation as much as we can, and uh, people, are, people are always going to use drugs. They always have for time immemorial, mm -hmm. so let's ensure they get the safest uh, drugs with the least harm. I, I think we owe that to ourselves as a society, uh, economically, uh, socially, and, and morally to do that. I, I think a lot of people um, that don't live in Canada look at Canada's health system and they're envious. Mm -hmm. And for Canadians, maybe we do take it for granted. Maybe we just don't think we deserve better. Um, what do you want people to take from your book? Well, I want them to take that uh, we get excellent medical care in Canada. When you're in the right place at the right time, the care is fabulous. But the, the system itself is not good enough. It's not allowing us to get the best of our healthcare providers. It's mm -hmm. not giving us value for money. And we could do so much better. So I, I'd like us to have higher expectations uh, for ourselves as Canadians, uh, not say things like, oh, well, it's okay to wait because it's free, in quotes. Mm -hmm. That's not okay. Other countries don't wait. And we should, uh, we should have, I think, as I said, much higher expectations of, of ourselves. How can we be better stewards of uh, the healthcare system? Well, I think some of it is personal. We have mm -hmm. to take some personal responsibility. We have to, I think, give our politicians license to improve. Uh, you know, one of the biggest things, uh, Joey Smallwood, one of the fathers of Confederation, once said, uh, I've never had a conversation about health care that didn't lose me votes. So we're very intolerant of our politicians and policymakers when they want to change things. Mm -hmm. Even though we know change is needed, we're really reluctant to, to allow them to change things. So we have to, I think as Canadians, have some leaps of faith there that things can be better, they can be different. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I would look to Europe and not look to the U.S. for, for guidance on that. Andre, this is required reading. I think all Canadians should read it. Well, thank thank you. you so much for being here. It's, it's been a pleasure. pleasure. Thanks. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.